Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizing, organizers for the invitation to speak here. It is always a pleasure to be at uh, ICTP. And second of all, I would like to apologize to the experts in the room because my talks, they will be fully dedicated to the students. So if you understand why symbolic dynamics are useful for dynamics on, on Thursday, I will already be happy, all right? You can stop me anytime you want to, to ask questions. So uh, what I would like to start with is with an example. And this example was already mentioned by Federico, uh, Federico last, last week. So what is the cat map? The cat map is just a, a very, it appears to be a very simple map on the two torus. It is, uh, you get this two by two matrix, which has integer entries and determinant equal to one. So you can induce a map on the two torus. And how is the action of this map? Well, that's what it does with the cat. So it stretches the cat in, in, in one direction, it contracts in another direction, and because you are considering the map on the two torus, you have to reassemble this fundamental domain to the basic fundamental domain that you are working with. So you get this piece here and you translate one unit to the left. You get this, you translate one unit down and one unit to the left, and you do the same thing with this thing here. So the cat gets distorted. My goal is to try to understand better dynamically this cat map. And how do we do that? Well, that's where symbolic dynamics is going to, is going to come. Uh, as you know, this map, it is a hyperbolic tor automorphism, so it has two eigenvalues. One of the eigenvalues has absolute value bigger than one. The other eigenvalue has absolute value smaller than one. So in particular, you know that two points, if they are distinct, they cannot be close together forever in the future and in the past, right? You have what is known as expansiveness, which means that if you get two different points, well, there will be a future iterate or a negative iterate or both that will make these two points at least epsilon apart, okay? In other words, you can say that this map is sensitive to initial conditions. And it, it is exactly this property of sensitiveness to initial conditions that is going to allow me to construct symbolic dynamics for this map. What is the idea, underlying idea of symbolic dynamics is that instead of describing what is the orbit of a point, So instead of describing what is the orbit of a point, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to discretize my space and I'm going to tell to which rectangles, to which all elements of the, this discretization my orbit is going to belong to. So I'm going to discretize the space and I'm going to describe the orbit of x not by saying exactly where x, f of x, f minus 1 of x and so on are, but by saying to which rectangle of this re discretization the iterate of my orbit belongs to, okay? That's the idea. So when you consider the cat map, well, you can consider the cat map with respect to the x and the y axis. Why? Because we are used to the x and the y axis, and this is just the same picture that, uh, that is in the previous slide. So what the cat map does with the, with the fundamental domain of the torus, well, it stretches, so it becomes this parallelogram, and when you reassemble, it becomes this thing here, okay? So the, the, the idea is that x and y axis are not the right system of coordinates to look at when you consider the cat map. You have a much better system of coordinates, which is the system of coordinates given by the dynamics itself. And what do I mean by that? Well, instead of considering the x and y axis, why not considering the eigendirections. I'm going to look what the map does uh, in the eigendirections. So this is the big idea of uh, Adler and Weiss and of Sinai, which is to, consider, to do the following. Okay, if I have this sort of hyperbolic tor automorphisms, well, why not considering these dynamically relevant eigendirections? In other words, what can I do is I will tessellate the plane with uh, rectangles, or with a fundamental domain like this, which is made of rectangles, such that 
each rectangle or each side of the tessellation is parallel to one of the eigendirections. So in this case here, you have these ones which are parallel to the expanding eigendirections and the other ones are parallel to the contracting eigendirections, okay? And why is it better to consider this system of coordinates? Well, because the image of rectangles will again be a rectangle. So it has a much simpler geometry and then it will be much simpler to understand what is the dynamics of this rectangle under the cat map. Actually, if you consider this fundamental domain and you divide it into two pieces, pi1 and pi2, what does A do with these two pieces? Well, it gets pi1 and it stretches in this rectangle here. So when you reassemble it back to the fundamental domain that you are considering, it, what it does is to cross pi2 once and it crosses pi2, pi1 twice, right? This is this yellow part here when you put this down one unit and when you get this and you put one unit down and one unit to the left. And it does similar things to pi2. It stretches and the image of pi2 becomes this very thin rectangle which is cut in pi2 once and it's cut in pi1 twice. All right? So the great idea of Adler Weiss and is exactly, okay, let's change the system of coordinates and let's look at the system of coordinates that's relevant for the dynamics. Okay, so what is the main property of these rectangles that I'm considering here? Well, as I told you, I want to, instead of describing the, the orbit of a point, I want to describe to which rectangles it belongs to. So I would be happy if these rectangles have what is called the Markov property. And what is the Markov property? It's, it's a property that tells you which ways the rectangles can cross. So if you have a rectangle R, for which when you iterate it, it intersects a rectangle S, it has to, it, to intersect all the way down from one side to the other. So this is one allowed intersection and this is a not allowed intersection. Why? Because the image of the rectangle intersects the left hand side of S, but it does not go all the way to the right hand side, okay? And if you think why uh, you want this property, it is because if you have some, some possible passage from one rectangle to the other, it means that you have a point X that belongs to this rectangle and hits the next rectangle. Well, now if you have another passage from one rectangle to another, it means that you have a point Y for which F of Y belongs to S and F2 of Y belongs to T. And what you would like to do is to concatenate these two edges and get a point that belongs to R, whose image belongs to S, whose second image belongs to T. And if you do not have this uh, crossing property, this might not be possible. For example, if the image of R is like this, and if the image of S intersects T like this, what is the, what is the second iterate of R? Well. The second iterate of R will intersect S here, and the image of this piece here, here, will be this small piece here. So there will be no point that belongs to R whose image belongs to S and whose second image belongs to T. So our goal is to have this sort of crossing property, and in the case of hyperbolic total automorphisms, just like that cat map, we can do that, okay? So what is the final result for the cat map is that we are able to get what I call here a symbolic model for the cat map. What does that mean? It means that I got uh, my space T2 and I cut it, I discretized it in finitely many rectangles. And this uh, I'm going to call the set of vertices of my symbolic model. Well, if I have vertices, I also want to have edges. What are the edges in, in this uh, symbolic model that I'm constructing? Are exactly the allowed passages from one rectangle to the other. So whenever the image of a rectangle intersects the other, you draw an edge from the vertex R to the vertex S, okay? And then you got uh, uh, a symbolic space because what you have here VE is a oriented graph. In an oriented graph, you can consider all the paths on this graph, which you can index by Z. So the, the sigma here is a symbolic space given by the Z indexed paths on the graph. And in this, in this space, you have a natural dynamics, which is the action of the left shift, 
Okay? So sigma, sigma is what I will call a symbolic space, with, which I will later call a topological Markov shift. So uh, to get a symbolic model, I have to define a symbolic space, which I already defined, but I have also to define a coding. And how do I associate a point here in the symbolic space to a point in the two torus? Well, it is what this map pi does, and it is exactly uh, defined by the property that I want to, to see here. I want to get a sequence of rectangles, and I want to generate a point that's following the itinerary given by the rectangles. So there is only one choice for me to define this map pi, which is this infinite intersection here, right? So if by any chance this infinite intersection here consists, is non-empty and consists of a single point, then I'm in good shape. And uh, why is this the case? Well, it follows exactly from the dynamical properties. The Markov property allows me to concatenate finitely many rectangles and it actually allows me to prove that this intersection is non-empty. And the expansion and contracting properties of this hyperbolic toroidal automorphisms will guarantee to me that this intersection can be at most one point. Why? Because horizontally it will be exponentially small at, if you go up to time n. So if you go up to infinity, it will, be, it will have diameter zero horizontally and the same thing vertically. So it consists at most of a single point. So by these two properties here, I get my code in pi, okay? And why is that good? Well, because I can conclude that and you should regard this as F here. The cat map and the left shift are basically the same thing. What do I mean? I mean that I constructed uh, uh, a symbolic space with the shift and a coding pi that makes this diagram to commute. And also, almost every point here has exactly one pre-image on sigma. So this, this map pi here is one-to-one -one in a residual set of T2. So for the purpose of dynamics, we are in very good shape because we're able to translate the action of F in the manifold, in the two torus, by the very simple action, which is just a left shift in the symbolic space. And why is that good? Well, that's good because, for example, as I said, you can see, you can iterate the map in a very simple way, and also because you can count the periodic points that this map has. How many periodic points this map has? Well, it has at least as much as sigma has, because every periodic point here projects to a periodic point on the basis, right? So it is good for iteration, it is good for counting periodic uh, orbits, and it is also good for uh, get constructing and analyzing the ergodic properties of the invariant measures, right? So this is, this is the, the goal. The goal of symbolic dynamics is to to come up with a simpler system, which is usually given by a symbolic model that allows you to get properties, ergodic and dynamical properties of your complicated system that you start with. Okay, so what are the models that we are aiming to construct? Well, this is just an abstraction of the, of the model that I described previously. So in general, we are given a diffeomorphism and we want to find an oriented graph G, given by a set of vertices that I will always assume that it is countable, and a set of edges. And whenever you have this graph, you can consider the symbolic space generated by it, and it's just the set of Z index paths on G. And you have the dynamics acting, which is the dynamics of the left shift. So given a diffeomorphism, we are aiming to find such sigma, such pi, which I will call from now on a topological Markov shift, for short, TMS, okay? And it's not only sigma and sigma what we are aiming to get, we are also aiming to get a coding. So for each z-index path on this abstract graph, we would like to get a point in the manifold that makes the dynamics of the diffeomorphism that, I, that I'm considering to intertwine with the dynamics of the left shift above, such that I can reduce the analysis of properties below by the analysis of properties on this topological Markov shift. Okay, so this triple sigma, sigma pi is what I call a symbolic model for diffeomorphism and it is exactly what you are aiming to, con to construct. Okay, so in the, in the next lecture, I also expect to talk a little bit about symbolic models for flows. And what is the symbolic model for flows? Well, 
When you analyze flows, what you do usually is that you consider a reference section and you analyze what happens with the first return map to the section. So the action on the flow, it's just a, it's just a translation, just a linear translation. So what you're aiming to analyze really is to get some, some property with respect to the first return map. And in this first return map, if you have hyperbolicity for the flow, the first return map will be some sort of a hyperbolic diffeomorphism. So for the return map, what you expect to see is exactly a topological Markov shift. You expect to model your system within the return map with respect to a topological Markov shift. So a symbolic model for a flow will be, first of all, we are given a topological Markov shift, and we are given a positive function defined on this topological Markov shift. It will describe to me exactly the time it takes for me to start in the section and return to the section. It is a roof function. So whenever you have this data, sigma, sigma, and r, you can consider the suspension space given by this triple. What is it? It is the set of uh, pairs vt, where v is in the symbolic space, and t is below the graph of the function r, and you have this identification here. Whenever you hit the graph of R, you come back to the section by applying the left shift, okay? So this is the suspension space. It is a topological space, okay? And in this space, you can consider the unit speed vertical flow. You start with a point in the basis, and I will draw a picture to you soon to understand it better what it is. You start with a, okay, let me already draw it. You start with a point in the basis and you, start flowing at unit speed vertically above until you hit the graph of the function. And what happens when you hit the graph of the function? Well, you remember the identification that you, that you defined, and then you come back to the basis section, and then you continue flowing at unit speed vertically, okay? So this is the unit speed vertical flow. And this pair, the suspension space and this unit speed vertical flow is what I will call from now on a topological Markov flow, for short, TMF. Okay, so we already got the symbolic space or the symbolic, uh, yeah, the symbolic space and the symbolic dynamics that we aim to construct for flows, but we also need a coding. So we are going to have this and a coding that for each point on the suspension space, you associate a point in the manifold, and this is exactly what I'm aiming to construct for flows. It is a triple sigma r, sigma r, pi r, such that these first two coordinates define to me a topological Markov flow. This third one is a coding that intertwines, again, the dynamics of the flow below with the dynamics of this uh, unit speed vertical flow in this suspension space, okay? So here is the picture again, all right? Questions so far? Okay. No questions? Okay. So, uh, before uh, stating the, the results that, uh, that the most recent results, I would like to say a little bit about the old results. And the old results are always, always for most of the time for the systems which are uniformly hyperbolic either a Nozov systems or axiom A systems, okay? So just like I told you with that cat mat example, the first appearance for this, uh, these systems, the first construction of symbolic dynamics for these systems was given by Adler and Weiss in 1967, which is exactly uh, the two-dimensional hyperbolic total automorphisms, just like the cat mat. And at the same time, Sinai also gave a construction that works for a much broader class of systems, which is that of a Nozov diffeomorphisms. So these, these, these two were more or less at the same time, and a little bit after, Bowen was able to, to, to go further in the methods of Sinai, which the methods of Sinai, if you want to know, they are known as the methods of successive approximations. So Bowen was able to extend this method of successive approximations to axiom A diffeomorphisms, okay? And this, this, uh, 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 is are, are, are the, these are the main results for hyperbolic, uniform hyperbolic diffeomorphisms. What happens in the case of uniform hyperbolic flows? Well, Ratner was able also using the method of successive approximations to get this, uh, 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 this construction for a nozzle flows, and Bowen again in the same year was able to 
do it for a more general class of flows, which is that of axiom A flows, as long as we assume that the non-wandering set has no fixed points. So if the axiom A flow is such that it's no wandering set has no fixed points, well, you can, you can code it, you can get a symbolic model by a topological Markov flow. All right? Good. So what, what are the examples that this class, uh, these classes of systems include? Well, in the case of uh, diffeomorphism, they include all hyperbolic toro automorphisms. And in the case of flows, they include all geodesic flows on manifolds on which you have negative sectional curvature. Okay? These are known to be actually a nozzle flows. So by the result of Ratner, you are able to get a symbolic coding for these guys. All right? Good. So uh, what are the main applications that we, you can get from symbolic dynamics? And here is where I want to convince yourself that symbolic dynamics can give interesting applications for the dynamics of the, of the system. So let me start with the case of diffeomorphism, and let me assume that you have an axiom A diffeomorphism that is transitive and has positive topological entropy. Okay, so uh, by getting the symbolic dynamics, by constructing the symbolic model, one first application is that you are able to count periodic points more uh, uh, accurately. So that would be a P, which basically takes care of the possible period of your, of your uh, axiom A. If you assume the axiom A to be topologically mixed in this P will be equal to one. But in general, it's bigger than one. And what you have is that along the multiples of P, the number of periodic points is exponential and the rate of, the, of, of growth is given by the topological entropy. Okay, so it's E to the N times P times H. Okay, the second application is with respect to equilibrium states. So if you came to Vaughn's uh, lecture last week, you already know what equilibrium states are, or to Pablo Carrasco's lecture, which he also defined equilibrium states. So Bowen was able to use this symbolic model to, construct, to prove that each holder potential has a unique equilibrium state. In particular, there is a unique measure of maximal entropy for this class of systems, okay? And also, you have very good ergodic properties of these measures is that they are either Bernoulli or they are Bernoulli times a finite permutation, which I call here a rotation, okay? So this is Bowen, 1970, two papers, one in 70 and one in 75, okay? So what happens in the case of flows? Uh, again, let me assume that I have an axiom, axiom A transitive positive entropy flow, and I assume it has no fixed points. Let's assume, well, you only need it not to have fixed points in the non-wandering set. Well, the conclusion is, is the same as Bowen got here, but it's a little bit more complicated to prove is that phi has unique equilibrium states for each holder potential. Again, this implies that it has a unique measure of maximum entropy and you can further get ergodic, very strong ergodic properties of these measures, which is to say that they either define a Bernoulli flow or they are a Bernoulli flow times a rotational flow. So it's a flow on the, on the unit circle. Okay, you can also get, but it's much more complicated to get the counting of periodic, of closed geodesic, of closed orbits. So Perry and Polycott, they were able to, to, to prove that the number of closed geodesics of period up to T, so this, this is what this number defines, all closed orbits of period up to T, it again grows sort of exponentially fast, but you have to divide by t, because when you have a closed orbit, a closed, yeah, a closed curve, you don't know what is the base point, so you have actually a sort of a continuum number of closed curves. So as long as you divide by t, well, you get exactly the right rate, which is given by the topological entropy, okay? So these are the main applications. So now what I want to do is that I want to go a little bit further and no longer assume that my system has uniform hyperbolicity. What I want to assume now is that it's just asymptotically hyperbolic. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's see. So for the purpose of this talk, I will always assume that I have either a diffeomorphism defined in a surface or a flow defined in a three-dimensional manifold and that's why the title has low dimension. So because I'm, I will only consider these two situations. 
And if I have these two situations, I can define the notion of a high he hyperbolic measure. What is a he hyperbolic measure? Well, first of all, it is an invariant measure under the system that I'm considering. And I will assume exactly this asymptotic hyperbolicity. I will assume that almost every point has two Lyapunov exponents different than zero, different from zero. One of them, I have to assume that is smaller than minus he. It will take care of the unstable direction. The other, of, the other uh, Lyapunov exponent is bigger than he, okay? So then you ask me, okay, this is okay for the case of diffeomorphisms because I'm in dimension two, I can have at most two Lyapunov exponents. What happens with the case of flows? Well, remember that the direction of the flow, no dynamics happens. So the Lyapunov exponent in the direction of the flow is always zero. So this notion also makes sense for uh, flows. And what I'm saying in the case of flow is that I have, again, three Lyapunov exponents. One is smaller than minus he, the other is bigger than he, and the third one is zero, is the full direction, okay? This is in the, exactly in the context of non-uniform hyperbolicity because almost every, every point has Lyapunov exponents different from zero, whenever they can be different from zero, okay? Okay, good. So are there examples of such measures? Well, yes, there are plenty of examples, especially if you consider systems with positive topological entropy, why? Because if you know that your me if you if you have an initial measure which you a priori don't know that it is he hyperbolic, but you know that it is ergodic and it has entropy at least he, then the Huel's inequality, which relates the entropy with the sum of positively up and the exponents, tells you that your measure is actually he hyperbolic. Okay. So whenever you have positive topological entropy, you know by the variational principle that you have many measures, ergodic measures, with a positive metric, kolmogorov sinai entropy. If this kolmogorov sinai entropy is bigger than, than this threshold he here, then automatically, assuming it is ergodic, you get that this measure is he hyperbolic. Okay? So there are plenty of he hyperbolic measures in the systems with positive topological entropy. All right. So what are the examples? Well, the examples for diffeomorphism, the most known example is that you get that cat map that we started with and you slow it down in, a, in the fixed point. If you want to know more about this, you can watch Yasha, Yasha Pessin's uh, talk in, on Thursday, right? That he's going to, to say, to talk about exactly about equilibrium measures for this slow down of the cat map, which is nowadays known, nowadays known as the cat talk map. Okay, and in the case of flows, this, uh, this context of non-uniform hyperbolicity includes geodesic flows on surface, which I no longer assume to have negative curvature everywhere, but just non-positive curvature, okay? So if I have non-positive curvature and I want to rule out the case of the torus, so if I assume that the curvature is non-identically zero, when you consider the geodesic flow, what you get is a flow with positive topological entropy. All right, an example is to get a surface with high genus and just put a, a, a cylinder on it. The Lebesgue measure on, or, or the, the geodesic flow on this surface will have positive topological entropy. All right, okay, this follows, this follows from a formula that, uh, that, Pessin, uh, that Pessin has for the topological, for the metric entropy of the Lebesgue measure actually on, this, on these surfaces. Okay, so this is the context that I want to consider. And as I, as I told you here, well, you start with uniformly hyperbolic, with the uniform hyperbolic case, and how do you get uniform hyperbolicity? As long as you have negative curvature, for example, in a manifold, the geodesic flow is going to be uniform hyperbolic. If I relax the condition to having non-positive and non-identically zero curvature, I get a non-uniform hyperbolic. But you could ask, uh, does it, do there exist surfaces which have positive curvature in some parts, but still you have positive topological entropy? And the answer is yes. There are examples uh, constructed by these guys here. And how are the examples? Well, the first one is in genus zero. So you get the sphere and you blow it up into six points, just like here. And in each of these blow ups, you put a cap. 
you put this cup here and you consider the geodesic flow on the surface, well, this geodesic flow is going to have positive topological entropy. The idea is that a point, uh, the ge a point walking through a geodesic here spends much more time in the region of negative curvature than in the region of positive curvature. So on the average, asymptotically, what you get is what you would get in the uniform hyperbolic case. You get expansion and you get contraction, okay? You can also do that in the case of genus one. For example, you get the torus here and you blow it up in this number of points. And in each of these, you put a focusing cup. You get this guy here. Well, the geodesic flow on the surface is again going to have positive topological entropy, all right? So this class of uh, non-uniformly hyperbolic flows is much larger than the class of uniformly hyperbolic ones. Okay, so what do I want to say now? Well, I want to say what are the results that we're going to discuss in this mini course. So the first one is, again, remember that I always assume that I'm in low dimension. I'm either with a diffeomorphism on a surface or with a flow on a three-dimensional manifold. So let us start with a, a surface diffeomorphism. What is the result, uh, the, the first result in, the, in this context of non-uniform hyperbol hyperbolic surface diffeomorphisms? Well, it is given by Katok, which used uh, passing theory in order to get a surface diffeomorphism with positive topological entropy and construct horseshoes with large positive, large topological entropy, okay? Unfortunately, his methods did not allow, in general, to construct horseshoes with full topological entropy. This, uh, this uh, difficulty was bypassed recently. You, actually, it, the paper was published three years ago by Sarig, which was, he was able that given a C1 plus beta surface diffeomorphism, so you assume this regularity, you assume that the derivative is beta holder. So given a C1 plus beta surface diffeomorphism and given a threshold he, I can construct symbol, a symbolic model, model for F. What is that? Well, remember that a symbolic model for diffeomorphism is a triple. The first two coordinates define a topological Markov shift. The, sec the, the last one defines the coding, which here we get that it is whole continuous. And what are the main properties of this coding? Well, first of all, it has to be relevant for the dynamics, so it intertwines the dynamics of my diffeomorphism with the dynamics of the left shift. The second property is that it has to be relevant somehow, it has to be coding a large portion of the dynamics. And Sarig was actually able not only to code one measure at a time, but he, he was able to code with the same symbolic model all measures that are he hyperbolic. So this is usually a, an uncountable number of measures, but he was able, yes, given a he, I can code at the same time all measures that are he hyperbolic, okay? You should regard for now, uh, for the next uh, 30 seconds, that this is just the image of, of, of sigma itself. Forget about this uh, sharp here. Okay, so, okay, we have a good coding, but in order to be good or in order to, to, to get interesting dynamical properties of the map below, I should be able to get this symbolic model above in a way not to increase a lot the complexity of the system that I start below. Because I could increase a lot the complexity and well, knowing things about the complexity above would not tell me anything about the complexity below. So in order to get this uh, no increase in complexity, it is very important to know finiteness to one properties of this extension map pi. So in the case of Sadiq's theorem, he is able to get that for all points in this image here, when you look at the number of pre-image that you have above, this number is basically finite. So the number of pre-images, again, in this sharp set here is finite. So morally, you are, you are constructing a symbolic model that is finite to one. And you know by Rochlin's uh, uh, formula that finite to one extensions do not increase the entropy. So what you did is to build a symbolic model above that does not increase the entropy of the system that you started with. In particular, whenever you start, to, in particular, you can do 
many things. One of the things is that you can start with a measure here and lift it above in a way that the entropy of the measure above and the, met and the measure below are exactly the same. So this lifting property, which is usually not satisfied by extensions, guarantees to you that measures of maximal entropy below are somehow related to measures of maximal entropy above. So you can get some information about measures of maximal entropy, for example. So this is the result of Sarig. And uh, just to complete, what is the sigma sharp? The sigma sharp is what is called the recurrent set of sigma. Gener uh, generally, the sigma is a topological mark of shape, so it's given by uh, an oriented graph. Unfortunately, what happens in the non-uniform hyperbolic case is that this oriented graph is usually going to have countably many vertices. It will not have finitely many vertices. So it makes sense to define what is this recurrent set and what is this recurrent set? Well, it's the subset of paths on your graph that have a vertex that repeats itself infinitely often in the future and has a vertex that repeats itself infinitely often in the past. Well, this is a subset of sigma, but it's a good subset of sigma. Because you know by Poincaré recurrence that all measures that are supported on sigma that are shift invariant, they, are, they give full weight to this sigma sharp, right? So for the purpose of measures, this is a cheap condition to impose. And, this is, and imposing this condition allows us to prove exactly this finiteness to one property. Okay, so this is the result for surface diffeomorphisms. There is a, a, another result which is still in the case of, not of diffeomorphism, but maps, which is symbolic dynamics for non-uniform hyperbolic billiards. So what is a billiard? A billiard is, let us assume that you consider a compact domain with piecewise smooth boundary, call it T, and inside this T, you can consider the billiard map. And what is the billiard map? Let me draw, for example, T like this. The billiard map is, you, can, you start here at the boundary of T in some direction, call this theta, and let me parameterize the boundary by this parameter R. And what you do is that you walk at unit speed inside this table, which we call the billiard table, until you hit the boundary again. When you hit the boundary of T again, what happens is that you, you have a specular reflection and you continue walking. So what happens with the, these angles here is that theta prime here, the angle in, of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. Okay, this is the billiard map. And where does it live? Well, well, I didn't say. It is a map F that lives on the boundary of T cross the allowed angles minus pi over two, pi over two, and it sends a point here to another point, which is exactly the next hit on the billiard table. Okay, so these maps, they have a natural Liouville invariant measure, which is given by this formula here, okay? R is the, is the parameter code in the, the boundary. Theta is the parameter code in the angle. So mu given by this formula is F invariant. And, well, you are in the case of a surface because the boundary of T cross an interval is a surface, is actually a cylinder. So you could wonder, why not applying the result of Sarik directly to this, to this setting? If you have, for example, that this measure is, has positive entropy. Well, unfortunately, that map F, billiard maps, they are usually not continuous. Why? Because you have these breakpoints here, and you also have what are called the glancing orbits, that an orbit could be tangent to this region here. So tangencies and singularities of the curvature guarantee to you that this map is not a diffeomorphism, okay? And also, its derivative is not bounded. So you are in a much more complicated situation than in the case of surface diffeomorphisms. But nevertheless, it is possible to adapt the methods of Sarig in order to get a symbolic coding for these this systems as well. So the assumption is that if this measure mu here is ergodic, and if it has positive entropy, well, ergodic plus positive entropy, what did we learn by Wells inequality? We learned that it is re-hyperbolic. So you have this measure mu being here hyperbolic, and what you can get is that you can get a symbolic model for these billiard maps. So you get a pair sigma sigma and a coding such that the same properties as I mentioned before hold. 
it intertwines the dynamics, it is relevant for the, my, my reference measure, and it doesn't increase the complexity of the system that I started with, okay? So what are the examples that you have these two properties here, ergodicity and positive entropy? Well, you have, for example, the C9 billiards, which are also called dispersing billiards, in which the boundary is made of convex uh, curves, but you also have what are known as billiard, uh, Bunimovich billiards, which are the union of uh, segments and pieces of circles, which define a non-uniform hyperbolic billiard. For example, this one, which is the billiard table with pockets, this one, which is, is a, probably the most known one due to the physicists, which is called the Bunimovich Stadium, and this one, which is called the flower, okay? In all of these billiards, if you consider that invariant Liouville measure, this measure is going to be ergodic, this measure is going to have positive entropy, so you can apply the theorem for that case, for, for these cases, all of these cases. Okay, so to finish today's uh, introduction, well, actually, almost to finish today's introduction, I just want to mention what is the result for, that we will discuss later, for non-uniform hyperbolic uh, uh, flows in three dimensions. So we start with this three-dimensional manifold, consider a flow, actually first consider a vector field. So let's, let us assume, different from the, the case that we were assuming previously, that our vector field is different from zero everywhere. Before in the uniform hyperbolic case, I was only assuming that there are no fixed points in the non-wandering set. Now I, I really want to assume that it, there are no fixed points anywhere, okay? So given this vector field that defines a flow, I call it phi, uh, okay. And I want to consider a He hyperbolic measure. So consider this He hyperbolic measure mu. What is the result in, in collaboration with Sarig? Well, is that this triple M phi mu has a symbolic model. And what is the symbolic model for the flow? Remember, it is a topological Markov flow and a coding. And well, I want the good properties for the symbolic model as well. What are they? When you look at the su suspension of unit vertical flow on sigma r, and when you look at the flow on the manifold, what the coding does is to intertwine these two flows. Okay, good. This coding is and I forgot an R here. This coding is relevant for the measure that I started with, so the, its image has full measure, and also it doesn't increase the complexity of my system. So for every point in this image here, the number of pre-images that it has is finite, okay? And again, what is this sharp thing here? Well, it is the recurrent set of this suspension space, which is given by all pairs, VT, where the symbolic, symbolic component is in the recurrent set of my symbolic space. So it has a vertex that repeats it infinitely often in the future and a vertex that repeats it infinitely often in the past. Okay, good. So observe the difference from this result to Sarig's result. Here we can code one measure at a time. Sarig was able to code all he hyperbolic measures simultaneously. Okay? Nevertheless, we can still get all the, the, the oh, let's say, almost all the consequences that symbolic dynamics gives to us. So to finish today, I will mention the main applications of these theorems, of these last three theorems that I told you. And let me start with the case of diffeomorphisms. The first one is counting of periodic orbits. You get exactly the same sort of exponential growth. Of course, since you are in a very general uh, context, which is that of non-uniform hyperbolic system, nothing prevents you that this number is actually infinity. You could have a piece of the dynamics which you have the identity, right? So the only thing that you can get is actually a lower bound on the number of periodic orbits. So this is what's given by Sarig uh, in the same paper that he constructed the symbolic models. And in the same paper, he was also able to prove that these, these surface diffeomorphisms, they have at most countably many measures of maximal entropy, okay? Basically because the symbolic space that you construct has that property. So you can project the symbolic properties below. Recently, this has been improved by Bouzy, Rovizier, and Sarig, which is that they prove that if 
you assume a further regularity of your system. If you assume it to be C infinity. And a very cheap topological assumption, which is a dynamical topological assumption, which is of being transitive, then actually you can only have one measure of maximum entropy. You always have at least one by a result of new house, but under this infinity transitive assumption, you do not get more than one, okay? The proof is related to, to this result of Rodriguez S, Rodriguez S, Tazibi, and Ures, which they proved that uh, surface diffeomorphisms they have at most one SRB measure. Okay, so, uh, and also Sarik got, observed that the publication year was before the, the year that he constructed the symbolic models, but this is a flaw of the system of uh, referees. But anyway, he was able to use the, the, the symbolic model that he constructed here in order to get ergodic properties of the equilibrium states, of equilibrium measures. So if you assume that you have an equilibrium state of a holder potential with positive entropy, then your system is either a Bernoulli automorphism or a Bernoulli automorphism times a finite rotation. It's exactly the same result that I mentioned of Bowen in the case of uniform hyperbolic systems. Okay, so there is also this result of Boyle and Bouzy, which discusses the almost Borel structure of surface diffeomorphisms. I will not say anything other than that. If you want, you can look at the archive. Okay, so but now let's go to the case of flows. And in the case of flows, if you have a, a three-dimensional flow with positive topological entropy, what consequences can you get from the existence of symbolic models? Well, again, we can count periodic orbits, and the counting of periodic orbits is, again, only one-sided. You can only get a, a lower bound, and it, again, is given by the same sort of formula. It is exponential in the entropy, and you have to divide by t. And here I forgot to add that this result only holds if you assume that your flow has a measure of maximal entropy. So in parentheses here, I should have put assuming phi has a measure of maximal entropy, which happens, for example, in the case that you are C infinity. All right? Good. So the other result is that you, again, can get at most countably many ergodic measures of maximal entropy, again, because the symbolic model has this property. And the final result is a, a result in collaboration with Francois Ledrapier and Omri Sarig, which is the, counter, the, the same version of this result of Sarig 2011 for the case of flows. So if you have an equilibrium measure of a whole potential with positive metric entropy, then the system it generates is either a Bernoulli flow or a Bernoulli flow times a rotational flow, okay? So for today, I think, uh, what I want you to, to, to remember for tomorrow is that what is a symbolic model and why are they important for the purpose of getting dynamical consequences, okay? Tomorrow we'll start discussing Bowen's construction, Bowen's classical construction of pseudo-orbits, and then we'll go further to Sarik's construction for non-uniform hyperbolic surface diffeomorphism, all right? So thank you, thank you for your time. <laughs>